sitting in the back, you are also welcome to come closer so that it's easier to, to discuss. So there are several issues uh, I think we can uh, uh, come back to. Okay. Of course, there are a lot. I mean, uh, of course, there are a lot in your mind that uh, I, I do encourage you, every one of you, to uh, bring your questions uh, up to the uh, floor. But I think uh, several questions, uh, for example, uh, uh, I don't repeat uh, whatever uh, Professor Bowie had uh, just uh, said, but there are several things that are uh, very uh, important to me would be uh, there's a marginalization of uh, non-Western uh, knowledge or indigenous knowledge. Uh, we actually had a debate with Austin Nello too, okay, concerning uh, returning or unearthing the uh, 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 subalternized knowledge. But the retrieval of this uh, so-called subalternized indigenous knowledge itself could have the potentiality of uh, its own uh, colonial power. Okay, uh, looking back to different historical processes, uh, for example, Chinese uh, or so-called uh, Confucianism. Uh, it, Confucianism itself, on one hand, could be uh, this a Eurocentric reconstruction. Okay, of course, as a nation of religion. But itself is a discourse of governmentality uh, throughout centuries. So, and it also is practiced by different ethnic groups and in different locations, including uh, Vienna, right, uh, against uh, Laos and Cambodia, and also uh, uh, Korean and so on. So that, that's one question that I would have. Uh, which knowledge tradition is uh, innocent? Okay, in terms of all different institutionalization or discussion of nation, and there's a cent center margin of uh, dichotomy in different fantasy, different uh, period. If it, whether this is a feudal society, colonial society, post-colonial uh, independent state, it's all possible. Okay, so knowledge itself, just like people, is highly mixed, and uh, this. Uh, uh, syncretism in whatever forms uh, could serve the government okay, of whatever nature. This is some, uh, one question I will raise <laughs> if, um, if I may, but there are other uh, very complex questions. Uh, we, we see that uh, apparently this marginalization in, uh, in theory uh, uh, and putting this um, culture and people into margin. I think it's uh, not only in terms of this uh, uh, epidemic framework, but also in terms of uh, this, it seems that it's uh, like a global civil war of one against the other of the Christian who has the uh, Islamic uh, communities. Uh, and that's felt by everyone, including our students on campus. So that's something we also need to address uh, at the World Talking. Uh, our student could address uh, these issues uh, too. Sorry, Jeff, could you repeat that? What was that, that second issue? Uh, people from with uh, Islamic uh, background who are, yeah. we have students from Uzbekistan, Palestine, Malaysia, and other, uh, other places. They, they all felt so in one way or the other, maybe. I mean, uh, being uh, taken as a target of. Uh, Suspect or uh, marginalized in some way. Some kind of uh, what they call it, Islamophobia. Yeah, right, right. That's yeah. Yeah. But that will happen too in some Buddhist countries, for example, Thailand or Vietnam, against uh, uh, Malaysia, not Malaysia, but the uh, Islamic population, like Myanmar too. Uh, that, that's one thing we could also address. Uh, the other thing, where uh, Professor Barry also is uh, very concerned about the indigenous people, right? For example, indigenous people in Taiwan or indigenous people in Vietnam or in India, but uh, in Philippines and uh, uh, Malaysia too. But we also need to put this question, indigenous people, into question. <laughs> Who are the so-called pure indigenous people throughout hundreds 
follows this kind of thought, you know, this decolonizing idea of um, veering away from Eurocentric perspective, from the, the, the Pantayo Pananao precisely. So, for example, when I wrote my, my bachelor's thesis, my very first publication even was in Filipino, because we always try to address this concern on um, starting from scratch, like trying to unearth knowledge systems that's been um, masked by colonialism, Etc. Etc. But um, my main concern today, which I really wanted to raise while hearing your presentation today, is that um, there's certain criticisms that arose, and maybe not in the 60s, but maybe more recently, on this Pantayon Pananao. I think you're familiar with it. Uh, just for everyone's knowledge, Pantayon Pananao could be roughly translated. Uh, well, actually, translation is also problematic in this sense because I'm forcing myself to translate these ideas to another language which is also violent in a sense. But, well, just for the sake of conversation, it's us from us. So this, this a discussion of a particular phenomenon in the Philippines should be discussed from us by us, for us. So, um, and then there's also this um, emergent discipline called Psicología Filipino, which means um, Filipino psychology, yeah, um, which tries to understand different uh, perspectives in our history, 
or in our psychology in terms of the Filipino language. So in this sense, um, the, decoloni the decolonial process happens through going back to the original language, like the, 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 the base language, and try to understand foreign concepts using our own language. But the problem with that is, which I actually see, because um, after leaving my bachelor's in history, I did try other disciplines, so I ventured into sociology and anthropology, where I learned um, different you know, Western, uh, Western uh, scholars and the pillars of sociology, for instance. Um, we come to realize that uh, when we actually write, even if we try to write in our own language, I mean, it's, we still end up trying to you know, um, theorize something based on the local language, but also borrowing from Western thoughts. So it gives us this dilemma that um, we try to unearth some local knowledge systems, but in doing so, even, if, even the process of going back to the language is still falling into the trap of using Western, um, Western methodologies or Western um, Western concepts. So, my first question will be, how do we actually address that? Um, secondly, um, like for example, for yeah, let me talk about that. Uh, yeah, of course, of course, please. <laughs> uh, it's very long, and I'm afraid your next yeah. your second question will also be long. And <laughs> <laughs> this is the first question. Um, yeah. Well, all right. Well, that's that's um, um, it's a good point about language. Um, but I think you're, there are two issues here. One is language, and the other one... It all, also falls in this um, notion of nativism, or cultural essentialism. Like, for example, we try to interpret things in our own local language, but the interpretation ends up being somehow still Western in concept. Like, or sometimes when we publish something in Filipino, in order for it to be understood by other scholars, you know, for the sake of you know, rankings and stuff, we are forced to translate our own works into English. And when we translate it into English, the concepts are almost entirely gone. Okay, but I don't think those are, are, are problems. You know, um, I, I don't think trans. Of course, there are there are problems with translation. Um, uh, through translation, you may actually, for example, orientalize um, uh, the work of a scholar. For example. Um, Something that I did um, on Ibn Khaldun. Uh, in Ibn Khaldun, the the, the main um, in, in, in in the thought of, of many scholars, especially scholars of history and society, um, in, in Western thought, for example, there is the, the main division is between town and country. Right? Now, what about in Taiwan? What's the main division? In the way people think about society is it also town and country? Or is something else? But you, you understand my, my question. Um, now, Ibn, in Ibn Khaldun, he made a distinction between um, um, nomadic and sedentary society. Right? Now, the terms in Arabic that he used, um, Hadara and Tadara, should be translated as sedentary, meaning settled, settled society, and nomadic society. But many Western scholars translated it as rural and urban, because they're looking at it through their own lens. But this is not a problem of, uh, of language, it's a problem of understanding. Because for Ibn Khaldun, Sedentary society includes rural and urban. So, rural and urban together, which is sedentary society, settled people who do not move around. That's one. And the other, the contrast is nomadic society. But when Europeans look at that division, they look at it through their own lens and they and, and through their own experience. So it becomes town and country or rural and urban. Now. In my part of the world, in, in the Malay world, Malaysia, Indonesia, and it would include the Philippines also. Um, we don't even have a uh, division like town and country. Why? Because the important distinction for us 
is land and sea. Because people live on the sea also. We have the, the what we call the Orang Lao. Uh, or I think the, in the Philippines you have, um, I don't know what the term is, for people who actually bajau. Bajau, bajau, bajau. That's the name of a group. Yeah, uh, the linguistic group. Yeah, which, which uh, for... But they're also Orang Lao. We understand Orang Lao. You understand Orang Lao, that's right. So now in, in the Malay, in, in Sumatra, in the Malay Peninsula, which is now the western part of Malaysia, uh, we we have a distinction between orang. Uh, first of all, there's orang da, uh, lao and orang dara. Dara is land. But even on land, there's a distinction between uh, hilir and hulu. That means people who live upstream and people who live downstream. So the town country distinction doesn't work, right? Um, and it's not a problem of, of of language. It's a problem of conceptualizing conceptualization. If, if, if you have the right conceptualization, even if you speak English, you will be able to correctly conceptualize um, the history of political economy in the Malay world. If you understand these distinctions. So, um, so, so my, my, my point is that um, simply speaking your own language doesn't mean that you're not going to be Eurocentric. So Arabs, who know Ibn Khaldun, who read Ibn Khaldun in Arabic, may still interpret his distinction in terms of town and country. Because they are Eurocentric in the way of thinking, even though they do not speak any European language. So you can be thoroughly Eurocentric in Tagalog, or in, uh, in Malay, or in Mandarin. Right? On the other hand, you could be anti-Eurocentric and write in English, as what many of the Indian uh, scholars uh, have done, or the Latin American scholars.